Well, Wes, I'd like to thank you. When I first met Wes up here for the Whatcom County Historical Society, both of us had no gray in our hair. So, uh, as, as he said, time does fly, and apparently with history, it, it's uh, a, sort of a, a gray hair virus that goes around, turns your hair gray early. You'd never guess, I'm only 32 years old. <laughs> we'll keep believing that. Okay, let me pull out my magic wand here. Um, Mary Jo, if you want to hit the lights there. Today I'd like to introduce you to Footsteps on Front Street. Uh, this is a book that the museum did uh, because we kept getting lots and lots and lots of questions about downtown Linden history. And this is actually volume one of uh, what will ultimately be a three volume series. Uh, volume two is Pioneer Downtown and volume three is Anything That's Not Downtown. Uh, we're not entirely sure when volume two and volume three are coming out, but we hope that volume two will be coming out next year. But uh, this is, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a method that uh, I determined to use because I had all of this information in my head, so I needed to put it down on paper uh, in one way, shape, or form, and it freed up a tremendous amount of space. So it's sort of like, you know, when you have your computer is all filled up and you just got to print out some of those photos and put them into a photo album because you just can't carry them around with you all the time. So here we see Front Street in Linden. And as you can tell, given the cars, it's right around 19, late, mid, mid 20s, early 30s. Uh, so, or mid, mid, late 20s, early 30s. And you'll notice that the trees are still there. Of course, Linden is famous for its front street trees. But if you were to look closely at these, you'll notice that these are maple trees, not oak trees. Today, Linden has pin oaks there. Uh, and the maple trees were actually printed, or printed, planted quite a while prior to this. They were planted back in the early teens, uh, as Front Street was just beginning to get, become developed and become the entrance to the town of Linden. Many people don't realize it wasn't really until the early 1900s that the Guide Meridian became the actual entrance to Linden that we know, know and love today. Uh, previously, before the 1900s in Pioneer downtown, if you were going to Linden, you were going to come up the Hannigan Road. You're going to come in across the Hannigan Bridge, which went in prior to the Guide Meridian Bridge, and you'd come right up what was known as Collies Hill at that point in time and right into downtown. Because if, you know, if you take a look at Linden, downtown is really sort of in an odd place, given, uh, given a, that your front is over on the Guide Meridian. Now add to that that currently the front entrance to Linden is between two cemeteries. Uh, of course, I've, hopefully you've been to Linden and, and know that uh, as you come riding in there, there's uh, Linden Cemetery on the south and Monumenta Cemetery on the north. Uh, and of course, everybody sort of wonders, well, why did Linden put its entrance between two cemeteries? Well, because it didn't. Uh, that was the back end of town when those cemeteries went in in the 1890s. Uh, and so well, I should say when Linden Cemetery went in the 1890s, Monumenta went in in the 1920s. But, uh, but that was the back end of town, so much so that uh, the road from 13th out to the Guide Meridian was initially known in 1896 as Cemetery Road, not Front Street. It wouldn't become until 1901 known as Front Street, or a continuation of Front Street there. <clears throat> this is starting over towards the entrance of Linden here, so we're starting over right in the corner of 3rd and Front. And this is the famed Liberty Theater of Linden. And what I want to do this night, this evening, is just sort of explore some of the, the, the better known old landmarks of Linden. And the Liberty Theater was quite an interesting piece. It was owned by the Whiteheads, uh, and, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hollenbeck is the one who owned it originally. The new, Mr. Newman was then uh, the one who bought it from Mr. Hollenbeck. Uh, and the Whiteheads had a, a um, they had next to it the Liberty Cafe. Uh, where you could get a bite to eat and a drink, and then right across from it, Linden's first service station, uh, which was known as Linden Service Station. But the Liberty Theater is a fabulous piece in Linden history because it is a piece that exemplifies the interesting aspect of the Dutch migration into Linden. Now, of course, I guess the first, first show of hands with Linden history. How many people here know that Linden was not settled by the Dutch? Oh, that's good. Almost half of you. <laughs> Of course, today's Dutch influence in Linden is, is quite extensive, uh, but the Dutch really didn't begin arriving until the mid-1890s. Uh, so Linden had a good two decades going prior to the Dutch actually showing up, and it isn't until 1900 when the Dutch, first, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch community establishes what we now know as the first Christian Reformed Church. Back then, of course, it was just the Christian Reformed Church, uh, and uh, the community begins to grow. And it isn't until the 1920s that the Dutch population numbers about three-quarters of the Linden population, and 
and then, for lack of a better term, the what we know today as the Dutch Linden really takes off. And so that's where one of the stories goes of this, because of course, as part of the Calvinist uh, denomination, uh, there are a number of pieces that are prohibited pieces, and one of those pieces is motion pictures. Uh, and it is, oddly enough, uh, the uh, Newman ran the theater up until post-World War II, just after World War II, uh, and so the Dutch didn't seem to have too much of an effect uh, on, the, on the theater and its, and its proprietorship, uh, other than the continuous... Um, I'm not going to call it boycotting because it wasn't necessarily a boycott, but uh, the continuous effort to not go into the theater in any way, shape, or form. Uh, actually, I should say, um, so uh, uh, quick, remind me, when did Gone with the Wind come out? 1934, yes, thank you. And so everything comes to a head with the Gone with the Wind. And it's really fabulous because a number of... Uh, uh, elderly ladies and gentlemen have, have, uh, who are of Dutch descent reported to me that uh, when the poster for Gone with the Wind came out, it was quite risque, of course, because if you remember the poster, there's Rhett Butler, there's Scarlett O'Hara yeah. dipping down, yeah. but that wasn't the important, the important thing. The important thing was, was Scarlett O'Hara was showing quite a bit of cleavage, and uh, that apparently did not sit well with the church elders. So what the church elders did was they directed, being that they had first approached Mr. Newman at that point in time and said, uh, would you please remove the poster, Mr. Newman? No. And so they instructed their children, because the Christian school was on the eastern side of Linden, while most of the Dutch lived on the western residence side of Linden. So they had to walk past that. So your choice was to either walk up on Grover and, and skirt that in, in its entirety, or if you were walking along Front Street, then you were instructed to walk on the north side of Front Street, not the south side, so that you couldn't easily see that poster. And of course, as we all know, uh, Gone with the Wind it created a, you know, havoc across the United States with uh, having cuss words in it, or a, cu a cuss word. Darn it. But... Uh, but it was an interesting piece. Uh, as you can see also, uh, one of the things that it was on a regular basis, open on Sunday. <laughs> Didn't sit well with the Christian Reformed Church at all. <clears throat> but uh, when we first found this out of the Whitehead album, uh, I was just absolutely tickled pink. Uh, and we got it just before we started putting this book together. Uh, because I, I, we had any number of things, advertisements about the Liberty Theater, we had any number of stories about the Liberty Theater, it was well ensconced in, in the tradition and the history of Linden, yet we could find no photos of the history of, of, of the Liberty Theater anywhere. And then the Whitehead album magically appeared and there were these three photos in there of the Liberty Theater. Uh, the Liberty Theater was also referred to jokingly by Saul Lewis, who is the uh, publisher and owner, uh, editor of the Linden Tribune at the time, as Newman's Wind Tunnel. Uh, that is because apparently uh, it was quite a hot piece uh, when you were sitting in there, and so they, Mr. Newman put in some big fans up top, uh, and Saul Lewis was a, similar to me, had a little bit of uh, free-range action going up there as far as the hair, uh, and so uh, he was forced to wear his hat while watching a movie. Uh, because elsewise the top of his head got cold, but his feet stayed warm. Uh, and apparently, it's a, he jokingly referred to it as Newman's wind tunnel, even though both of them were quite good friends. Uh, here we see, uh, looking, we're right smack dab in the middle of 3rd Street on that top photo, looking north. And this is another picture that I really like because the, those old maple trees, oddly enough, were also planted right along 3rd Street, going north up to Maine. And until I saw this photo, also from the Whitehead album, I had no idea. I just assumed that it was just a situation where just, you know, the, the, the trees came up to, to uh, uh, 7th Street, ended, there was downtown, and then when they put in the pin oaks after the maples started getting a horrible disease, they took the maples out in 1962, I believe, uh, and uh, replanted the pin oaks and uh, decided at that point in time to run them then from um, right there by the museum down to 1st Street in Hannigan. Uh, and uh, then I saw this and I was like, oh, I don't know why they didn't continue to plant those maples or, you know, replace the, the maples with the Pin Oaks heading up to, uh, to Main Street there. Uh, down in the bottom uh, is uh, the Motorama Raceway and Laundry Center. Um, again, the Motorama is one of those pieces, you can tell this is a much later piece, 1970s is when this picture was taken, but uh, this was a great piece because the Motorama was basically a place for early RC cars. 
So you could head down there as a kid and you could race RC cars around. And of course, RC cars and um, race, you know, the little electric racetrack cars were brand spank fangled new. You know, they're really coming out. I remember when I was just a little kid, I kept watching all the commercials on TV in 1960 or uh, 1976 about, you know, you can get this. And I can't, even, what is the name of the, um, it was always Saturday mornings. Boy, you'd always see them, those, the, the, the two car racetrack kit that you could buy for, well, twenty nine ninety nine or something like that. And I would go rouse my parents out of bed to get them to, you know, we need to buy this, mom and dad. So anyway, the Motorama Raceway is something that many Lindenites of, um, of slightly older than my age, uh, so in their 60s now, uh, remember fondly running down there to race cars around the track in one way, shape, or form. Uh, here we have uh, the interior shot of Ed Edson's drugstore. Uh, Ed Edson's drugstore is where Dutch Mother's is now. Uh, and this is a really neat piece because the building still stands. Uh, you can head in there and <clears throat> you can't see it on this picture over here, but you can see it over on uh, the uh, left picture and the bottom picture. Actually, I have a little laser pointer to need port. This tin ceiling up here is actually still part of Dutch Mother's which is really neat uh, because it somehow magically survived the aspect of in the 1960s when everybody had the, uh, the, the drop-down tile ceiling. Uh, when they first, when it wasn't Dutch Mothers and it was an, another piece, uh, the drop-down tile ceiling covered that. And so when Dutch Mothers first went in to begin opening and they pulled out the, the ceiling, they exposed all that beautiful old uh, metal tile up at the top. And the other neat thing about the Edson Drugstore is you can see thing here. Up here, these birds. Okay. Well, I was just overjoyed to hear Mary Jo talk tonight that those birds are going to be going back on show and exhibit because Ed Edson ended up donating his collection to the Watkin Museum back in, Mary Jo, do you remember when that would have been? I think back in the 60s, I think. Uh, I don't know. 1940, you know, was the, the first big collection of birds came. Okay. Oh, the 40s, that early. Okay. So... Yeah, but he was, he was a well-known bird taxidermist. He only did birds, but he had, how many are in that collection? I, we've got like 12 up at the museum. 500, over 500 birds were <laughs> Edson, the first director of the museum, Edson, the taxidermist, and then a guy named Booth. Okay. Very good, yeah. So Ed Edson was well-known for his birds, and so I'm glad to hear, like I said, I'm glad to hear they're going back on display, because it is, it is a really unique collection of local birds. Uh, apparently the idea was, was that if you found a dead bird, you brought it into Ed Edson, and he would probably taxidermy it if it was in good enough shape to, to stuff, and then he'd mount it up somewhere in the shop. Uh, one of the neat things about Ed Edson also to talk about here is, as you notice, uh, he was the fourth, the 21st, and the 24th mayor of Linden. Um, <laughs> Ed, Ed Edson is one of my favorite historic characters out of Linden because he was, uh, he's one of those pieces that exemplified the idea of uh, many of the pioneers moved out west because they just couldn't stand the society of the east coast. They just couldn't live there anymore. And Ed Edson was one of those. He was a pacifist. He was um, a, a, a staunch pacifist, a staunch capitalist, and... Um, a, a firm believer in the, he was also a, a firm atheist and a firm believer in, the, in science. And uh, apparently that was enough to alienate him from most of everybody, his friends and, friends and family on the East Coast. So he had to move out here. And uh, he was so staunch in his beliefs uh, that um, when his son Gail Edson decided to head off to World War I uh, as part of the Army Medical Corps, uh, Ed Edson as a pacifist actually would not speak to him didn't speak to him for eight years. Uh, apparently there were words, and, uh, and Ed Edson basically said, I, I just can't condone this, I can't, do th I can't do this, even though Gail Edson specifically was joining the, uh, the medical corps and vowed to not carry a firearm in any way, shape, or form, to hurt another soul. You know, he said, Dad, you know, I understand you're a pacifist, but there's a lot of people getting hurt over there and I need to go help them. And his dad's reply was basically, well, it's their own fault if they're gonna be the ones that go and enter a war. We don't really need to help them. He was, you know, like I said, very, very strong in his beliefs. Uh, and <laughs> the fourth, when he was the fourth mayor of Linden, um, he was apparently a fairly likable guy and the community was small enough. Uh, his 21st mayor was because nobody in Linden wanted to be the 21st mayor. <laughs> 
So Ed said, well, if I've done it before, I'll do it again. Uh, and pretty much the same with the 24th, because uh, by the time the 22nd mayor came along, uh, they had had enough, so much of Ed once more being mayor, <laughs> that they decided anybody other than Ed would be a good mayor. So they ran somebody against him. Uh, and then the 24th, um, he actually ran against somebody. Uh, and, um, and although he won, uh, the 20, by the time he ran against that person in, as the 25th mayor, uh, the person then becomes a 25th mayor. Uh, that was because they had once more had uh, you know a, a year's worth or a, a couple years worth of Ed Edson being mayor and had decided, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> now we remember why we run people against Ed Edson. Uh, like I said, though, he's he, fabulously well known, generous fellow. Um, was always well known for, for helping out wherever he could uh, with any of his friends, family, or even strangers in town that he disagreed with. Uh, but um, we do have a small collection of some of his letters, and that's where it's interesting to see that I know what happened with Gail Edson because uh, the letters span um, 1917 through about mid-1918. And uh, he talks with, and the letters are a piece where he was writing to his friend, uh, and we unfortunately we have the the friend reply, we don't have his letters sent, they didn't copy those, but his friend's reply letters to him where his friend uh, uh, admonishes him for, you know, Gail Edson is your son, you should really talk to him, you know, you're going too far. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to see because there are a couple of times that, um, that Ed Edson would apparently questioned his friend, was I doing the right thing? And this was his best friend, a fellow down in San Diego. And um, oddly enough, his best friend was the exact opposite of Ed Edson. Devout Christian, um, he was a communist at the time, or was a burgeoning communist party, uh, and um, was, uh, uh, you know, felt in regard. Well, I wouldn't say he was a he was a pacifist. He certainly wasn't. I don't want to, you know, he wasn't a warmonger either. But uh, certainly understood World War One and the need. Uh, one of the things we see here is uh, the dike building being built. Uh, the dike building is still standing. It's currently linden paint and trim. Beautiful old building with some great tile work on the front of it. Um, and they've done a pretty good job of maintaining the interior as well as far as the old interior. Uh, you can still head in there. Uh, it's a two-story building. There are actually still apartments on the top that can be rented. Uh, but uh, one of the neat things we have with this picture that I really like is it's an early construction picture that we have here. And you can see how they're using horse-drawn with... Um, slip scoops to scoop out the dirt so that they can dig the basement. Uh, and then of course, piling any of the dirt once they slide it into a pile over here, piling it out and then taking it away. Uh, so it's a neat piece because it really exemplifies what some of that early technology was. And by the time this goes in, uh, I mean, the building was built uh, in 1920, and they were still using horses for the primary means of excavation uh, in 1920. A lot of people don't realize, even though cars were becoming more and more regular, uh, just because the automobile and the internal combustion engine was becoming a regular sight on the roads, it didn't always necessarily mean that the internal combustion engine uh, had been widely accepted by agriculture or industry at that point in time. Uh, so you didn't necessarily see caterpillars and big scoops and things along those lines doing that unless you're looking at something like a really big uh, large size excavation of some sort. Uh, initially it would house um, the uh, People's, State, uh, uh, People's State Bank and these are a couple of the teller windows from People's State Bank. Uh, and um, one of the neat things about that is, is that, uh, unfortunately, I don't think they did anything with it, but across, this is directly across the street from the, uh, the Waples building. And at some point, there was an, a Billy Waples and People State Bank, the Lacoques, uh, had created a pneumatic system. And there was a small tunnel that Billy Waples could do direct, I mean, literally, this is like the first time direct deposit occurs. What he would do is he would head downstairs. It was uh, the other side of the building from the vault, but he would, you know, it was, it was the office, the accountant's office. And so all the cash and everything would go into the pneumatic tube, and they would just pop it in the pneumatic tube. <laughs> right across over there to a People's Bank. People's Bank would be on the other side. It would fall out into the tray. They'd do the deposit, <laughs> send the deposit slip back. <laughs> so it's a very early uh, direct deposit system. Oh, uh, I was going to say, the other aspect of it is, too, is that a lot of people later in life remember... Uh, uh, the Dyke Building is housing uh, McLean Drug, and McLean Drug was probably the preeminent drug store for Linden, really from the 1930s up through the 1970s or so. Uh, unfortunately, McLean it went to his son, and uh, his son was selling uh, prescription medication out the back door, and uh, ended up closing, getting caught. <laughs> uh, here's a neat piece. It's looking 
northwest on Front Street from, front the, uh, from the corner of Front and Fourth Street. It's about 1925. Um, here we have the Bilsma building right here. Uh, and you can see it is at that point in time the Western Mercantile Company. And this is an, a neat piece uh, because this building is still standing today. It's a uh, flea market international antique store. Uh, was housed many different things ranging from S&H auto parts um, to a, a, just a number of different stores that were, were in there over the course of uh, Taylor's Furniture, Van Rye's Furniture. These are just a number of different pieces. The other thing you can see down here too is this building here, which of course many recognize now, but, one of the, but the neat thing is it's got one, two, three, four, five, six windows, and the cornice is a peak as opposed to flat the way it is today. And this took me a long time to figure out when I first started working at the museum. All these pictures of the Waples, we, we got like a good 30 plus pictures of the, of the Waples building in various forms. But finally one day I noticed that there must have been some sort of an extra iteration. At some point, he expanded his building because of the current building then has two more windows there, eight windows total, and it has a flat cornice up at the top of that crown. And what he ended up doing was this building he ended up buying. He sheared off right about here and built a second story and built the whole front to match that. And it's really neat to see, of course, as a, uh, one of the beautiful, well, I'm going to say this a little bit of, with a little bit of grace, and that is that uh, you always try and find the, the silver lining in any dark cloud, storm cloud. And of course, when the, the Waples building burned, uh, what, eight, ten years ago, uh, the great thing that came out of it was you actually now had a chance to go through and I ended up crawling through that building for about a day looking at all the different architectural features that had been covered over by decades of remodeling and everything else and so you could clearly see the original dividing wall between those buildings. Uh, as I said, you got to go downstairs and you could see the, 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 the tunnel with the pneumatic tubes. The pneumatic tubes were actually still there. Um, all they did was filled in gravel into the tunnel as best as they could and then walled the whole thing off. Um, so it was really neat to actually be able to see sort of the skeleton of that prior to it. And I got to say that uh, Matt and Terry Treat in the process of bringing the Waples building back to life have preserved a tremendous number of those features. Uh, so they're really neat pieces. Um, the other aspect you can see here is one of the lost buildings of Linden's history, and that is this one right here. It would have been right across 5th Street and, uh, from the Waples building on the northwest corner uh, of Front and 5th. And that's the old Judson Opera Hall, built in uh, 18... Uh, oh goodness, let me get this right, 1888 uh, with um, ostensibly, and I don't know if this is actually true or not, but this is what's, what the sto as the story goes. It was built in 1888 utilizing, all, the only trees it utilized were the trees that were cleared from the property. And apparently those trees were beautiful. I got torn down in 1995, and I had been working at the museum for about two and a half, three years at that point. Uh, and, you know, somebody, somebody, it got torn down. Everybody knew it got torn down. It was going to, new building was going to go in its place. And uh, I was walking by one day, and there's this big pile of rubble, and I see sticking out of it this huge beam, I mean, easily a two-foot by ten-inch beam. And looking at it, I got a little closer and looked at it, and it was not laminated. It was a single beam. And so I went up to the guy and said, could I play around with this beam? I'd really like to take a look at this beam if, I, if you don't mind. And uh, he sort of looked at me funny. And I said, I'm with the museum. This is, call it a historic research project. Uh, and so went through the beam. There wasn't a knot in it. There was about 40 feet of beam there uh, before it broke. And uh, not a knot in that 40 feet. And I even went so far as I picked out the biggest piece of grain that I could find on the beam because it was an unfinished piece. Uh, and um, followed that, pe that grain down, and it had a variation of less than two millimeters from one end to the other. And so it was, I mean, it was true old growth beam there. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they took it off and burned it, but, um, uh, but it was really neat. And so, uh, as I said, I don't know if it's actually true that the trees came from, from the actual land that the, the building was built on, uh, but it did contain some gorgeous old growth uh, wood in it. Uh, here we see the Recreation Tavern, also known as The Rec. Uh, this was one of the longer lasting taverns in Linden's downtown. Uh, actually, this is it when it was on the north side of the street. Uh, and um, it ended up moving all over the place in, in downtown as it uh, 
banged around. Uh, originally started by Wally and Andy. Uh, unfortunately, I've never found their last names. Uh, and it would move around downtown. Um, this is that building that we looked at earlier uh, right here. So here we see the Linden Department Store. And this is the building ultimately that they would buy and change into that eight window Linden Department Store. And let's see here. Oh, that's right, I got two of those. So still on the north side of the street, now we're down at the corner. This is Gilmore Gas, located on the northeast corner of Front and Sixth Street. Um, this was built, this is where the Chamber of Commerce currently stands. And that tree in the background is, of course, a well-known landmark in Linden history, still standing today, probably the actual oldest standing structure in Linden, if you want to call it a structure, and that is Phoebe Judson's old black walnut. Uh, the Gilmore Gas Station, uh, as I said, uh, also known as Mock's Gas Station, because it was, uh, oh goodness, what was Mr. Mock, was, what was his first name there? <laughs> Doesn't say in there, does it? Um, oh, it was Mr. Mock, not Jack. Uh, anyway, Mr. Mock was there, started that gas station, uh, and uh, ultimately the gas station would be turned into, um, oh, I should say, it was torn down and part of it was used for, a, uh, for the... Um, uh, Washington Mutual Bank. And it was an interesting piece. This, was, this happened in the early 1980s, and across from the museum you have U.S. Bank. And there, apparently there was this little trick that you could do under, under a local building code that uh, if you maintained a certain amount of the original structure, and a certain amount of the original structure involved the foundation and one standing wall, that it, you did not have to meet existing necessary disabled access code, you know, uh, code. You didn't have to meet all these all these other different building codes, and so you could build the building as if it was a building, and treat it under the the building code from the 1920s. <laughs> and so, when uh, Washington Mutual uh, went in there, that's exactly what they did. They tore down basically 95 percent of that building, leaving this foundation and one standing wall, and then built the bank off of that. Uh, U.S. Bank did the same across from the museum, which at the same time, which used to be the old um, uh, Vanderpool and Moss service station. And so apparently service stations were very popular for banks to easily buy out and turn into banks. Uh, later it would become Town and Country Realty, uh, and of course in uh, June of 2002 it would be turned into the Linden Chamber of Commerce and will probably stay that way for quite a while. There we go. Uh, here we have the Jameson Building, and the Jameson Building is this one here. This is that um, Judson Opera Hall on the north northwest corner of Fifth and Front. So here's Front Street running along. This is Fifth right here, Judson Opera Hall, and the Jameson Building. The Jameson Building is one of the older buildings still standing in Linden. Uh, it was, built in 19, it was initial, initially built in 1912 uh, as a dry goods store. In the 1920s, it would become the Crescent Mercantile. Uh, and um, 1938, uh, it would burn, it would, the horrible fire w w which would end up damaging the Judson Opera Hall. Uh, in 1940, um, the new Crescent would reopen in there. Unfortunately, the Judson Opera Hall from that standpoint onwards until 1995 when it's torn down would remain vacant because the damage to the Judson Opera Hall was enough that it was, uh, nobody wanted to fix it and it wasn't worth tearing down and building on and it would remain vacant until that point in time in which it was torn down. Um, numerous different stores had gone in there, uh, and uh, now, it, it, at one point, it was the uh, J.C. Penney, and um, now it is uh, uh, Farmers, oh goodness, um, Farmers Insurance. Andrew Jewell Farmers Insurance Insurance Agency just bought the building and is now inhabiting it, having opened about two months ago. What is the history of the museum building? How old is it? Oh, my it? goodness gracious. Okay. Uh, well, it was originally built in 1911. Uh, it was built by a fellow named John Spahn, uh, who ideally wanted to establish a, uh, uh, an implement dealership, a farm implement dealership, uh, and um, built it on the site of an old, well, there was a, a small blacksmith there. Initially, he, then he built the building. Uh, the blacksmith worked out of the back, uh, what was known as... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I said John Spahn, I meant um, Abe and Gert Bauman. What was ba known as Bauman's Implement then opened. Unfortunately, Abe Bauman was a horrible businessman, and within three years, he was nearly bankrupt. Uh, and so it was then taken over by a fella, and I can never remember the name of the fella, who was ultimately then bought out by a guy named John Spahn. 
Uh, John Spahn was, of course, part of the new Dutch that were influ or influxing into Linden at the time. Uh, and uh, John Spahn would end up uh, establishing what was known as North Washington Implement Company, and then in 1918, he would buy the franchise for uh, the John Deere dealership here in Whatcom County. And so it would be known as North Washington Implement, the, or more colloquially known as the John Deere dealership. Uh, it would stay the John Deere dealership uh, from, um, is it 1918 up until 1974, I believe, is when they moved. Uh, the building at that point was empty. Uh, John Deere, the John Deere dealership moved down to where the WTA terminal is on the corner of um, Front Street and uh, 18th which is uh, right there next to the cemetery. So as you're driving into town, you know, you've just taken a, a, hook, to right, a, a hook to right into, the, uh, into Linden, you're driving along past the cemetery, and then there immediately on the south on the right side is the WTA bus terminal. So that was the old, that was then the new John Deere dealership. Uh, that ended up moving then out to, um, off the Guide Meridian to the big new John Deere dealership, I believe in 2001, somewhere right around there. Uh, still called North Washington Implement, but that was when Jim Hale then owned it. Um, I see here. Uh, some of the neat things about that are that, uh, so going back to sort of the museum aspect, uh, North Washington Implement has the building up for sale, and this would be the third try by the citizens of Linden to convince the Linden City Council that uh, they needed a museum out there. And up until that point in time, the Linden City Council kept saying, because uh, they had approached them twice before in the course of the, de the, the decade, and uh, the Linden City Council kept saying, well, we've got no place for it. There's, there's, there's no building big enough, because the whole museum hinged on the, the Polander buggy collection. And what was Fred Polander going to do with the, bu the Polander buggy collection? They needed a building at basically the size of a barn somewhere. Uh, but there were no barns downtown or any that were willing to be sold at the time. And so... Uh, so the third, you know, third time's a charm. They come before the city council. The city council, there's no, there's no room, there's no place. And so they stood up and they said, but what about the John Deere dealership? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that might be big enough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so um, at that point in time, it, uh, Jim Hale had just purchased in, bought into it, uh, and Dorothy Otter was part of that. Uh, and so they effectively sold the dealership, uh, that the dealership building, for a very good price to the city of Linden so that the city could start that. And so the, everything is finalized in 1976. By 1977, the Linden Pioneer Museum opens its doors uh, in October. So that's the reason that we have our open house in October every year, because that was when we first opened our doors, although it was at that point in time late October as opposed to early October. But yeah, it's, you got a little bit more light in the evening in early October. It's a little warmer and less rainy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's the base, and then from there, of course, it was Linden Pioneer Museum, and I could go on, then that would be a whole other presentation on how the museum developed, because uh, the existing building has been added on to, was added on to in 1984, uh, and, um, and that is sort of a story unto itself. So, so that's sort of the museum in a nutshell. Any other questions about Linden history, Linden area? Yes. Why did all the Dutch people move to Linden? Why did all the Dutch people move to Linden? Well, um, according to uh, Van Hinty, uh, Jacob Van Hinty, who wrote a, a fabulous work back in the 1920s called The Nederlanders in America, uh, the Dutch migration to Linden was part of an actual large-scale exodus east uh, of the Dutch, or I should say um, west from the Dutch of the East Coast and from Europe. Uh, and um, it, the Dutch migration is really sort of an interesting piece because the Dutch are actually some of the earliest, uh, you don't want to call them colonists, but they're some of the earliest visitors to the United States. Of course, New York used to be New Amsterdam, and the whole tale of selling, you know, um, Long Island for some beads and blankets type of a thing. It was the Dutch that were doing that. Uh, so it was the Dutch that managed to, uh, to, to grab that, make that deal, so to speak. Um, and I'm trying to remember, because then the Dutch sell out New Amsterdam to the English, who then start an English colony, start calling it, of course, New York at that point in time, and that begins the history of New York. Um, but the Dutch maintain a large presence in uh, the United States, uh, well, what would ultimately become the United States at that point in time, uh, mainly as traders. Until, say, two or three generations of traders start continuing to live here, and, and ultimately, you know, their kids grow up here, and then their grandkids start growing up here, and then you start getting Dutch settlers. 
And you start getting some of those Dutch settlements on the, uh, the East Coast, oftentimes, unfortunately, misnomered, such as the Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, which are, while they are Germanic-y sort of Dutch, <laughs> they wouldn't actually call themselves Dutch. Um, but what begins happening is in the late 1890s, uh, the, what has happened in, in Holland is a schism. And this is where I get to make my great Dutch joke, and I don't mean to offend anybody here, because if you know if you know Dutch and you know Dutch theolo any Dutch theologian, theologians, uh, this is actually pretty funny. And that is, if you have one Dutchman, well, you've got a congregation, you've got a religion. If you've got two Dutchmen, you've got yourself a congregation. If you've got three Dutchmen, you've got a schism. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, which is great because um, somebody after this asked me about why there's six uh, Christian Reformed churches in Linden, because uh, that's also a good story. Uh, but um, anyway, so uh, uh, Calvinism went through a, a big schism over in Holland. And so you had the Dutch that didn't live in Holland, which were known as the American Dutch. Then you had the Dutch Dutch, uh, which were the, at that point in time, the Calvinistic Dutch. And the Calvinistic Dutch mm, were somewhat welcome, somewhat not. As some of those schisms began to get some of the more extreme versions of Calvinism, they were indicated they really weren't very welcome in Holland because at that point in time, the, the um, uh, Netherlands Reformed Church uh, was the official state church. So a lot of these really, really conservative, uh, uh, really sort of very extreme Calvinist groups start coming over to the United States. And they settle in places like Pella, Iowa, New Holland, Michigan, um, a lot of places right up there, sort of that north central United States. Well, then you get the Oregon Trail uh, and that sort of westward expansion piece. And uh, some of them decide, hey, we're gonna head out west. So they decide to head out to the west coast. Uh, and one of the things which I find in it at, at that point interesting, and that is that there were three equivalent national banks operating in the United States at that point in time. And so they, uh, and, and those three effectively had between them a monopoly on um, loans for land in the West Coast. Of those, two of those were banks that were run by Dutch that had strong ties to Holland. And there was always this question of why were the Dutch farmers settling on the West Coast more able and more capable of farming their land and paying off their loans faster than the non-Dutch? And it actually turns out that, uh, uh, this isn't Van Hinty, this is a, a later piece that was published in the 1950s is looking at, at those early bank accounts. If you were Dutch, you got a lower loan rate for buying your land. So there's a little bit of that going on. So, so the banks, in effect, are, really a, are, are almost paying Dutchmen to settle on the West Coast. Uh, and the Dutch, as they were moving out, because remember, these are Dutch that are coming over not as, as Dutch, they're coming over as religious communities surrounding usually a congregation or a church. Uh, and so as they arrive in various areas, they will then literally up and move as a congregation. And so the first Dutch begin arriving in Washington State uh, that are, um, at that point in time, Christian Reformed. And Christian Reformed was considered to be one of the more extreme conservative aspect, Calvinistic aspects of the Netherlands Reformed Church. Uh, although it's really funny now that the Netherlands Reformed Church is way <laughs> more conservative uh, and uh, Calvinistic than the uh, Christian Reformed Church. But at that point in time, it was opposite. Uh, so the Dutch begin migrating west. They settle, a lot of them end up settling in western Washington State out on Whidbey Island in, uh, near Coopville. And uh, some of them from Coopville decide that they're going to head north uh, because they keep hearing about all this cheap land in Canada. So they head up to Canada and, uh, and find out that the land, well, either the, the prices have risen since they've heard it or somebody was lying to them, but all the land in, in southern Vancouver was really pretty expensive. And, but when they went up there, they went up there via, via boat along the sound. Uh, and they, so they decided to walk back. And there were three guys that walked back, uh, Dalve Zilstra, uh, Herman Ort, and, um, oh, Van Zant. I can never remember Van Zant's first name. Uh, so these three guys are walking back, and Herman, uh, excuse me, uh, Dalve Zilstra, or also known as DJ Zilstra, was the oldest among them. And he was the only one that uh, was old enough to actually remember what Holland looked like. So as they've crossed the border and they're coming back down south, they're coming, they're coming through Whatcom, they pass through the Linden area, they come through the Linden border crossing, and uh, apparently Dalve Zilstra says to these other two guys, you know something, this place really reminds me of my childhood in Holland. Because at that point, land is beginning to be cleared, and you can't really quite see the mountains, and you know, he lived on the coast, and so he had the coast there. And, so, and, and most importantly, at that point in time, everything, all the, the farmland around Linden was peat. <laughs> It was all peat bog. And of course, if you know Holland very well, uh, that's pretty much what they farm on top of is peat up there. Uh, and so um, 
He said, this really reminds me of my home in, in, uh, in Holland. Boy, I miss Holland. Boy, I wish I could go back. I just, you know, the US, uh, United States just in Americas just aren't what I thought they were going to be. So they decide to stop in, in Bellingham in the, in the assessor's office to see what prices are going for, and they find that land up here is really very affordable, much cheaper than Vancouver area and much cheaper than um, Whidbey Island and the Seattle area. So they're like, hey, hot dang, we're going to buy ourselves some land. So they bought themselves some property up here and commenced the farm. Uh, and uh, you know they went back, grabbed their families from Whidbey Island, uh, came up here, and when they did that, of course, any good Dutchman uh, is um, who's looking to buy land is suddenly going, <laughs> "Well, here's a chance to sell land at a profit and uh, go buy some land cheap and still make the same amount of money as farming, et cetera, et cetera." So suddenly, you saw a bunch of the uh, the Coopville area Dutch begin to move up to Linden. And what they did, because Dalve Zilstra was uh, in the, in the um, Christian Reformed Church, was an actual ordained minister, he was capable of starting a Christian Reformed Church. And so the Linden Christian Reformed Church, what we know today as the first Christian Reformed Church, was started in Linden in 1900. And suddenly, it was the only Christian Reformed Church west of the Cascades and north of Seattle, south of Vancouver. So all these Dutch from Coopville, all these Dutch from Eastern Washington, all these Dutch started moving in, and then you start getting this process early on uh, as the Dutch begin to move in, and, then, and that's what I call the first migration, the first wave. They established that core Christian Reformed community in, in Linden. Well, of course, they're still also related to a ton of people back in Pella, Iowa, New Holland, Michigan, back in the East Coast. And so then what happens is the Depression hits and the Dust Bowl hits. And you have a bunch of people then decide, well, we can't go back east because back east is no good. We can only go out west. We don't know anybody. Well, no, but we do know cousin so-and-so or brother so-and-so. So they head out here to Linden. Uh, and the great thing is, is they've got a place to stay for as long as they need to, to play, you know, lots of food. And while, you know, the depression and, and, and everything was bad out here, in Whatcom County, at least out in the rural areas, there wasn't a food shortage. You didn't make any money, but at least you could still eat and you still had shelter. So the second wave of migration for the Dutch occur. Now the third then comes just prior to World War II and just after World War II. Uh, just prior to World War II are the Dutch that are trying to escape knowing what's going on. Um, Holland, you've got to remember, outside of Germany, Holland had the largest uh, number of registered Nazi party members. Uh, and Holland was actually quite surprised when Germany invaded because Holland was more than happy, at least a majority of, member of, of, the, of the citizens in Holland were more than happy to ally with Germany as a neutral country uh, and not sending anybody to war, but they were more than happy to sell goods and, and, and be an industrial purpose for the, uh, the Nazi war machine. Uh, so then Germany invades Holland, and Holland is like, what's going on? This is, why are you doing this? And uh, Germany, apparently just because they could and wanted to. Uh, Nazi Germany never really answered that question. But um, there were people that, in, prior to World War II that did, were not Nazi sympathizers that decided they were going to get out because they were seeing what was happening already in the 1930s in, in Germany. Post-World War II, of course, after the occupation of Holland, uh, it's, just, it's a wreck. Holland is an absolute mess. When the Germans left Holland after the Allies invaded, uh, they flooded the vast majority of it. They broke a lot of the dike system, and so all those beautiful farmland areas were just laid to waste. The cities were laid to waste by both Allied and German bombing. Um, I mean, it was just a ruin. And so there was a, a tremendous number of Dutch who simply said, there's, and they were Dutch youth at this point, there's, n there's really no place I can go. So I'm gonna head to the Americas. Uh, and so they headed to the United States, uh, settling both Canada and uh, the United States, and um, oddly enough, a lot of them ended up finding their way to Linden somehow. Uh, and so you watch as this third migration then sort of happens, World War II to about 1960, as many of the Dutch uh, World War II uh, baby boomer generation or World War II generation begin sort of, they keep bouncing around the United States looking for Dutch, you know, looking for a peace, and they'll ultimately they'll end up in, in one of these very staunch Dutch communities like Linden, and they'll say, this is home, and this is where I want to be, and they'll end up staying there for the rest of their life. And so that's really how the Dutch began to arrive in Linden. Of course, by the 1980s and 1990s, you're just getting that beautiful movement across the United States of population, uh, and uh, Linden is just one of those places that if people would find it, it was off the beaten path, it was rural, it was nice, and it was, you know, sort of the great 1950s community that everybody remembered from their childhood, and so if they managed to find it, chances are they would retire there. Uh, so 19, the great thing is 1990s and the early 2000s, um, 
the senior population of Linden, i.e. people 55 and older, constituted 38% of Linden. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Linden is now back down to the standard where uh, usually senior population constitutes about a quarter to 20% uh, as, more pe as their kids have found it and are now moving into Linden. But so that's sort of how the Dutch arrived in Linden. Any other questions? Or shall I tell you the story of why there's six different Christian Reformed churches in London? <laughs> yeah, quick question. Yeah. Is that where the Farmer's Mercantile Hardware Store was? Um, it was one of, the cation, one of the locations for the Farmer's Mercantile. Farmer's Mercantile moved around, but it was one of the early locations. Um, initially, when the Judson Opera Hall opens in 1888, um, it is supposed to be Judson's Mercantile. Um, unfortunately, uh, Holden Judson was an awful businessman. I mean, he was, just had no concept of how to make, he, he had already bankrupted himself twice, or once in Vermilion, Ohio, once down in Grand Mound in Olympia, and then in Olympia, and then ultimately almost bankrupts himself up in Linden, but just decides that instead of, instead of trying to run a business, he's just gonna rent it out. <laughs> so he maintains ownership, he rents it out to uh, the Farmer's Mercantile, um, Oh, goodness gracious, uh, I think it was not the Knapp Brothers. Knapp Brothers were furniture. Um, Farmer's Mercantile, there was, uh, uh, there was an early on, there was another brothers um, that ran a mercantile out of there. Uh, and then can, a lot of people be, would run mercantiles out of that, the bottom portion of that store, uh, or the bottom portion of that building. The upper portion of the building was just one big hall. So that's why it was called Judson's Opera Hall. And that's where the community gathered for their Chautauquas, for presentations. We've got a couple of, a couple of great photographs of um, plays that people would put on out there in the Judson Opera Hall. And so it was sort of the community center of the time. I remember it. I had a great uncle by the name of Paul Breen. Yes. And he and a man by the name of Bob Anderson were partners in that farmer's mercantile when I was a little little boy. So I was one, I thought I was in the right corner there. It's right west of the Waples building. Right now. west yeah. of the Waples building. Yeah. yeah. Farmer's Mercantile for a while was also in the Billsma building. So then down at the other side of okay. that block okay. on 4th, uh, which is now the Farmer's, uh, or not far, is the uh, FMI Antiques. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think those are the two main places. I can't quite, for some reason I want to say that there was a third place that Farmer's Mercantile was located, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But those are the two main places that it was located. Absolutely. Yes. Hi. I'm um, interested in how the berry industry started around Linden. Oh, okay. And you might also include the migration of uh, both Mexican people and uh, the Sikh or the East Indian people. Um, I, uh, the Mexican, or I should say, the, the Hispanic Lata Latino population, um, I can speak to. Unfortunately, the Sikh population, I really don't know much about. I know that they're there, and I know it's you know that's a sort of a core area is the Linden to Deming sort of band that, that they've settled in. Um, I, but honestly, I'm not entirely sure why they ended up picking here. Uh, I know also there's a tremendous number of them up north of the border in southern Vancouver, and I think there might be a connection with that somehow, but I'm not sure. Uh, as far as the berry industry goes, Whatcom County agriculture is, is a fabulous story uh, because um, uh, it is, well, to start off Whatcom County agriculture, Whatcom County agricultural and farmlands are so rich and so fertile that I have at this point counted 47 different crops that have been grown for market. Uh, and that is grown for market, like in a professional capacity, grown for profit. I'm sure that there are then dozens uh, more that have been grown, uh, you know, just for your own personal consumption type of a thing. Uh, but, um, and they range anywhere from, uh, you know, many different types of berries to um, flax. Uh, right before the Depression, Whatcom County was trying to grow flax, uh, and it was a, a, a piece uh, that uh, ideally, apparently, because of the burgeoning linoleum industry at that point in time, uh, and then the Depression hits, and the linoleum sort of becomes a, you know, one of those conspicuous consumption pieces as opposed to something that everybody wants in their home because it's just too expensive. Uh, so the flax industry in, in Whatcom County collapses because, well, I shouldn't say industry, there's I think about three farms. It was just a burgeoning piece. Uh, then, of course, many of you know about the tulips. Uh, there were quite a few tulips that were grown up around uh, there. And again, it was also primarily the depression which caused the tulip farms uh, to fail up in, uh, well, throughout Whatcom County. Uh, but there are still bits of them around. If you head up there to uh, the corner of Guide and Main at the right time, time of year, you look at West, there's West Side Dewitt Center, and there's this big field right next to West Side Dewitt Center. All that used to be the old Van Zant bulb farm. Uh, 
And uh, if, you, if you look right there at the right time of the year, you'll still see these old you know, tulips and, and um, daffodils that are just still clinging. God knows how old those bulbs are. <laughs> <laughs> they're just being poking up out of the grass, <laughs> sort of scattered throughout there. So they're, they're still there. Uh, but um, yeah, of course, uh, between the Depression and, of course, you know, uh, the colder climate from the 1950s and 60s uh, just didn't allow the bulbs. But um, oddly enough, Linden was one of the primary uh, growing areas for hops in western Washington. Uh, and of all people, Phoebe Judson had one of the largest farms, uh, uh, hop farms, in um, uh, in Whatcom County, uh, and which is really ironic because she was a true teetotaler. She was totally anti-saloon, totally, uh, she was dry 100% of the way. Uh, and the fact that she owned a farm which sold hops for the purposes of brewing beer, that uh, was always sort of a you know, little bit of an irony. But um, we've got some great pictures of, uh, if they're, they're taken if you're standing sort of on the backside of Front Street. Uh, so, you know, Front Street, the buildings, and then on the backside of those buildings, all of that area from, um, from basically Hannigan down to BC Avenue was hop farm, stretching out to the river. It was, it was a huge lowland hop farm, and by hop farm, it was just be those beautiful pieces because, of course, hops are done on the, the, the vining piece, and so you'll have these 10-foot-tall poles with the, the bits ranging across, and the hops are tied up to those, uh, and um, we got a couple of harvest pictures of those, and then she had a, it was a huge, huge hop farm. Uh, the berries are, oh, we got a, a question or a comment in the back there maybe about hops. Sugar beets. Sugar beets, oh, sugar beets throughout Whatcom County. Sugar beets and potatoes, yes. Oh, okay, so it was a side, dip, a side tipping as opposed to a back tip dump truck is what you're saying. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, oh, that's, that's pretty slick. There are not a whole lot of, of dump trucks designed that way today, let alone back then. Yeah, but yeah, sugar, beet, sugar beets and potatoes were a huge staple. Um, uh, for a while, corn was grown for market as opposed to for silage. Uh, of course, these days, the cornfields you see are primarily grown for silage uh, for cows in the dairy industry. Um, at one point in time, Whatcom County was the single largest producer of eggs and, um, and uh, fryers. Uh, and uh, the, one of the, well, the, uh, it, the, the headquarters for the Washington Egg and Poultry Cooperative Association, if I got that uh, acronym in the right order there, uh, was in Linden, right there where... Um, uh, Fairway Center is. And I actually just got yesterday, I got some really cool pictures of a huge poultry processing plant that was located up off of Main Street and Double Ditch. Never even knew existed. Guy brought these in and I just totally blew me away that, I mean, this is, it's huge. I mean, like three-story giant factory buildings that I never even knew existed up there. But, um, but uh, anyway, so the, uh, so Linden was, was so much so considered to be such a central portion of uh, the poultry industry that Nally Valley used to put out Linden chicken noodle dinner. For some reason, the, the idea that if it was grown and raised in Linden as a chicken and, and, and came out of Linden, that it was the best fryer you could possibly get, similar to, you know, like today Draper Valley farm chicken commercials. <laughs> yes, Wes. Yeah, there were the couple of brothers that uh, built the Fairway Shopping Center. They had chicken farm there. The Ork brothers. Well, uh, it was um, uh, Coke, um, uh, Coy, excuse me, uh, Harold Coy who built the shopping center. But before that, the Ork brothers had their, um, uh, their poultry farm there. And they didn't do any processing, but they did, do, uh, they did raise chickens. And it is, we got this great picture. They also raised cabbage too, and they grew beautiful cabbage. Uh, but we have this picture that shows uh, sort of the, it's, it's standing back from where um, Grover sort of tees right in there to right along the, the, uh, the back. So if you're basically you're standing right in the intersection there, what you're looking at what is now true value hardware. And there are 13 coops, and these coops are like 50 foot long chicken coops, and there's 13 of them ranged in this row running down, and then in the back half is this huge uh, field of cabbage. Uh, but he, um, yeah, hundreds of thousands of chickens were grown annually and, and, and uh, 
apparently processed then off of the Main Street plant by the Ort brothers. They were one of the largest uh, hatcheries in uh, Washington state. But uh, anyway, so, the, and this is getting a long way around to the berry industry. <laughs> Berries have been grown for market uh, apparently since uh, the earliest I've seen as far as berries being grown for market is 1907, um, which was strawberries. And I cannot remember the farm. It came out of the Watkin Memories Project, and I want to say it was oddly enough out near Deming. I may be wrong on that. I'm trying to remember. Um, but a uh, beautiful picture of an early, early strawberry farm that was grown for market. Uh, so strawberries have been grown for market in Whatcom County for over 100 years at this point. Uh, raspberries began being grown uh, during the 1980s when um, Bosnia, Serbia, Herzegovina, and all the stuff that was going on over there uh, collapsed the, the uh, raspberry market because that used to be the world center for raspberries. Uh, and then of course, as all that war raged through there, everybody wanted raspberries, but nobody else was growing them. And so they started trying growing them in Northern California, and they still do, uh, but a lot of people found that um, the raspberries that you could grow up here in Whatcom and Skagit County were much better. Uh, and that you, know, you could still do it, and you could do it cheaper too. And so sort of that Southern Vancouver through Skagit County now, I mean, between Whatcom, Skagit, and Southern Vancouver, they produce over half of the world's raspberries out of this one single geographic location. I mean, it's like, couldn't even begin to tell you the millions of pounds of raspberries they put out. But yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm really impressed by the uh, harvesting machines. Yes, well, that's, of course, that is with, with that standpoint. Then you get Oxbow, um, now Latau Harvesters, and everything else that started that piece. And, um, and it's, it's interesting to see because anytime you have a large-scale agricultural center, uh, you, uh, sooner or later you have innovation as people try and figure out cheaper, better ways of harvesting those pieces. Uh, one of the pictures that we have at the museum, which is really neat, is um, the Ellen, Broth Ellen Boss brothers who uh, owned a machine shop in the early 1900s through the 19, I think 1940s uh, in uh, where the Windmill Mall is now. Uh, so at 8th and Front Street in the south side of Front, where the big windmill is downtown. Um, they were constantly innovating. And at one point when potato farming was big, back in the 1920s and 30s, they developed a potato harvester. And it is just, it's a, it's a rude Goldberg contraption if you ever saw one. It's just this huge thing with this big potato drum in the back and this, this piece that has a scoop up in the front under the front wheels and it's sensibly you drive it down the rows and it'll scoop up the potatoes and shakes bits off and then somehow it processes and cuts off the cuts off the tops of the potatoes and then the, the potatoes rattle around in this drum configuration type of a thing and a couple of people would stand on back as all the dirt and everything gets knocked off and they'd put the, the potatoes into the bag so they could just dump them off. Uh, and um, never actually got manufactured in any way, shape, or form, but it looks really impressive. <laughs> Uh, so I had another question. I, Candace, did you have a question or comment? Well, it was a chicken question. Oh, a chicken question. <laughs> that's, that's okay. You be brave. You can ask it anyway. <laughs> I just wondered if you knew when the Linden brand of chicken went out. Because my, I grew up in central Washington. That's all my mother would buy. Was and I Lin remember buying them after I got married. And then we moved to Arkansas. And they had these yellow, scrawny dried up things, and I was used to these beautiful, plump, white-skinned <laughs> Linden chickens. Chickens, yeah. So it can't have been that long ago that they went out of business. Uh, well, as, as far as Whatcom County goes, the poultry, business, the, the poultry industry finally bows out in the early 1970s. Uh, although I, I believe... Because it was a brand. It was a, yeah, it was an actual brand it name. It was brand, yeah. Yeah, and um, although uh, my understanding is that the, walk the, the Washington Egg and Poultry Cooperative Association actually maintained the Linden brand because uh, it was owned by the, the, the Poultry Association, not by anybody in Linden. And so even though it moved out of Linden, because uh, they consolidated down to that huge poultry processing plant down in southern Seattle. I think it's even still open down there. But... Um, uh, for then, uh, I mean, it's, well, let me put it this way. It was, uh, I remember going into Hagen's of all places in uh, 1991, and although I didn't know it at the time, um, until after I had actually gone up and started interning at the Linden Pioneer Museum, uh, they were actually still carrying Linden chicken noodle dinner uh, under the Nally Valley production piece. And, and it was, you know, so, up, uh, so the Linden chicken noodle dinner in a can was still there at least as late as uh, 1992. But any other questions? 
Okay, so just to let you know, because we had the, the, the schism joke earlier, and I always love telling the story of the, the Christian Reformed churches. Uh, so why does Linden have six Christian Reformed churches? Well, uh, because, um, as I said, the Christian Reformed Church and Calvinists are very good at splitting, uh, yet they never really quite want to split all the way. So they won't start a whole new denomination, but they will start a new congregation. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's because of a bad situation. Uh, in the case of the first and the second Christian Reformed Church, it was an interesting split because you had, the, at that point in time, what was the Christian Reformed Church in Linden, uh, which had all those newly moved in Dutch there that were all going and, and praying on Sunday, and most importantly, they were praying in God's own language, Dutch. And it, which was fine. They, they loved it, and they did a great job at it. And the problem being is that they did not diligently teach Dutch to their children, because the interesting thing about the Dutch moving in, the Dutch migration of the people coming over to the United States, even from Holland, was that, as I said, they didn't come, they didn't come over as an ethnic group. They came over as a religious group. Uh, and so when they hit the United States shores, anything that was Dutch, the klompen, the Dutch traditional dress, the Dutch holidays, unless they were religious holidays, was just shucked off. As far as the, as the, the Hollanders were concerned, they were going to become American. Because by God, they moved to America and they moved here for a reason. They moved here because they wanted to be American. And so, you know, no thatched houses. They used an American windmill as opposed to the Holland windmills, uh, you know, if they needed to process anything with wind power. And, and so by all, by all points and purposes, they were American. But they would refuse to give up their religious beliefs. And that's why they moved so much as a congregation, you know, these literally entire congregations would move as they moved around. And... Um, and so one of the things they did was, at becoming American, English was going to be the language, even though many of the, the, the migrating Dutch, the original first generation, st still spoke, obviously, Dutch is a first language, English is a second language. Their children ended up growing up speaking English as a first language, and they might pick up a smattering of Dutch. So by the time they're teenagers, they're here at the Christian Reformed Church, and they're going on through all the bits and pieces in Dutch, and these kids are sitting here going, what are they saying? I'm only catching like a half of this at any given point in time. <laughs> and so the next generation says, the sermons need to be given in English. We can't understand anything. And the Dutch, the Dutch father's like, well, no, you can't give a sermon in English. Why, that needs to be given in Dutch. So finally they come to a compromise in that the main service is given in Dutch. The secondary service, the afternoon service, will be given in English. And then they watch as that original Dutch generation slowly dies off or gets infirm enough that they can't make it to church, and the Sunday morning Dutch sermon has very few people in it, while the English sermon has quite a few people in it. So at that point in time, of course, instead of swapping over to just saying, let's just do it all in English, they start the Second Christian Reformed Church. <laughs> so the Second Christian Reformed Church is built and started, and it has all of its sermons in English. Uh, as soon after that, however, they, the, the first Christian Reformed Church then, and this would be because the second Christian Reformed Church gets built in the 1922, I think it is, early 1920s. Um, and so soon after that, then the first Christian Reformed Church, suddenly realizing that they're not going to be open very much longer, uh, decides to start giving their sermons in English. And so then people start migrating back and forth, and this is the 1920s, then you get the Depression, and a bunch of people start moving in from the Midwest, and so both the first and the second Christian Reformed Church now become huge, and part of the Calvinist process of the Christian Reformed Church is that if you reach a congregation number, and I want to say it's 300, but I'm not sure, but it's right around there, uh, when you reach a certain population within your congregation, you automatically start a new church. And so both of those then get together and split their populations off to start the third Christian Reformed Church. So then from there, the third Christian Reformed Church, it becomes the last time they, start, they, they use the third, the, you know, the, the, nom, the, the numbering system. From there, they start, you know, Sunlight Christian Reformed Church, and they start naming other Christian Reformed churches. Uh, and in some cases, they split off based upon theological issues where they, you know, the congregation feels that they're not teaching it appropriately, and so they're going to go off and start their own church. Uh, and, I, and one of the things I think is, is sort of ironic about that is that you can almost call it the Seventh Christian Reformed Church, and, and Christ the King is probably going to yell at me about this, but um, Christ the King, of course, is an ecumenical, non-denominational church, uh, and yet if you go to a Christ the King in Linden uh, uh, Sunday morning service, it sounds very, very much like a Christian Reformed service would. 
because a number of people that are dissatisfied with the Christian Reformed churches that they were going to migrated over to Christ the King, <laughs> and they're now once more practicing effectively some of the basic tenets of Calvinism in that piece. So it's like I said, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting to see. So uh, Calvinism is still very much alive and well up in Linden. Yeah. But that's, that's why there are so many churches uh, as far as that goes. And then, of course, then you have all the other churches of Linden because that I'm not entirely sure why there are so many churches in Linden uh, other than the Christian reform aspect because they keep spalling off and making new ones. Yes? Yeah, the reason that uh, the Dutch went into dairy farming is they're excellent cowmen. Yes, well, you are looking at, yeah. I mean, dairy, dairying is... Out of a cow. Yeah, da- a dairying is... there that's got Jersey cows and has a 70-pound average. Well, that's, that's like a Holstein cow. Yeah. They, they are good dairymen. Yes, well, the Dutch have, of course, a, a long tradition, even in Holland, of raising cows. Uh, it's, you know, one of the things that ma- many of them came over to the United States and uh, when they first migrated over in the, uh, the 1890s, those early guys were coming over and they were initially thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into industry or craft. But a lot of them fell back to farming because that's what they knew. And, and they were very good at it. <laughs> a lot of those that came over after the war, they, they went to California first. They didn't have anything. And milk cows, they got good pay. Yep. And they saved everything. And then as soon as they had enough money to buy a herd, they came up here and rented a farm, and they had, and then just went from there. Yeah. But some of those had three or four boys, and by the time the boys graduated, it was all free labor. Yep. They could retire. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's, that's one of the neat things about the Dutch community is regardless of where you come from in Holland, even though, as I said, they didn't migrate over as an ethnic community, they still treat other Netherlanders as far as the ancestry goes, as sort of an ethnic community. And so consequently, uh, you know, if, if you're from Holland and you come over and you have a name that is Dutch in any way, shape, or form, uh, you are just immediately welcomed with open arms in Linden, which is really sort of cool. Um, oddly enough, so that my, my, my last name, Luganville, is Swiss by way of Ellis Island, but apparently it's close enough to Dutch that a lot of people assumed that I was of Dutch descent when I first started working at the museum, which... It was, was great. It wasn't until like three years later after I knew everybody, they started asking me, are you, is your family Dutch? No, no, I'm Swiss. They're like, oh, well, okay, the Swiss are a little weird. Well, Swiss Mennonite? Oh, those Mennonites, those are good people. <laughs> you're good. Yep, you're right on. Because yeah. <laughs> the Mennonites are the only ones even more conservative than the Christian Reformed. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the Dutch, the Dutch do know how to milk, and I think that's one of the reasons the dairy farming still considers to be so strong up here in Whatcom County, is, I mean, it's, they do a good job at it, and most of them are Dutch still. Uh, oh, somebody had asked a quick question about um, Latino and Hispanics. Uh, Latinos and Hispanics arrived as part of the, um, and I never pronounced this correctly, so please, I, I'm very sorry to anybody, because uh, uh, apparently it's, it's a, also a slang term. It is the Br- Br- Braceros program, not the Braceros program, but the Braceros program, uh, huh? Braceros, with a with a, a sibling C. Braceros program. So the Braceros program, which was started during World War II to find um, uh, farm workers for, because all of our guys were heading over to the war either in the Pacific or in the uh, over in Europe, um, were grabbing Mexican laborers, uh, and so that starts the piece as people begin coming up here. Um, oddly enough, Phil Dorr, who was running the Linden stage uh, at the end, right before World War II, was about to go bankrupt uh, because there just wasn't, it was, there was just no money. I mean, people would either hitch a ride out to Linden or Bellingham if they needed to, or they'd ride a horse, or, you know, they'd do something as long as they didn't have to spend a nickel to get a ride on the on the bus. Uh, and, but he became one of the drivers for the Braceros program. Uh, he would head down to Seattle, and he would pick up many of those early Mexican agricultural workers uh, and bring them up to Whatcom County so that they could be dispersed, dispersed among the farms to pick up where uh, all the young white guys left off. So and that's, and then that just sort of continued on as a piece. And then you get into the, you know, the history, the, the late 20th century history of Mexican-American relations and all the problems that you have there. But that's why there are so many Hispanic and Latinos up here. Any other questions? Nope? Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. I always enjoy talking about my favorite subjects.